Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Welcome to the November 7th, 2017 Pulse Falls City Council meeting. And... Uh, Shannon, please note that all council members are present tonight. We do have a few announcements. As hopefully you all know, today is election day. You can vote until 8 p.m. tonight. City Hall and city business offices are closed on Friday, November 10th in observance of Veterans Day. The police department will be open. Coffee with the cop on Saturday, November 11th from 9 until 10.30 at Cabela's. No agenda or speeches, just an opportunity to ask questions, voice concerns, and get to know police department staff. St. Vincent de Paul's eighth annual support to end homelessness will be Thursday, November 16th, from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at Kootenai County Fairgrounds. $12 to taste 45 different soups and help a good cause. And uh, on the uh, 21st, Tuesday, at noon, I will be giving the State of the City, uh, my fourth one, which is hard to believe, from noon to one at the Chamber of uh, Commerce Connect for Lunch meeting, and that would be at uh, uh, Templin's Red Lion. If you'd like to attend, please contact the Chamber of Commerce for reservations. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Are there any amendments to the agenda? There are none tonight, sir. Are there any declarations of conflict? <clears throat> Gina, would you present the consent calendar please item a is minutes october 17th 2017 city council <coughs> meeting item b is minutes october 23rd 2017 city council and planning and zoning workshop item c is payables october 10th through october 30th 2017 item d is police department contract <coughs> with tologus for software for police vehicles and item E is contract with ML Architect for design work on the new animal facility. Item F is Bluegrass Point Subdivision Plat Application. Item G is Woodbridge South Subdivision Plat Application. Item H is North Chase Plat Application. <coughs> item I is Ross Point Annexation Agreement. And item J is purchase of a forestry bucket truck from the Titan Truck Equipment. I do have one question. Uh and that is on item J, the purchase of the bucket truck. <coughs> uh, Brian, my only question is $120,000, and, and tell me that it's, that's uh, cost savings and efficiency for the city, please. Okay. Uh, Brian Myers, Parks Manager for Post Falls. Uh, we did look at the options of contracting this type of service work out. Uh, we also looked at you know, what our staffing costs are to be able to operate this, this unit. Um, and what when we were looking at the whole project and the whole needs of our city, we have main thing is tree maintenance of both park trees and, and city right away <coughs> infrastructure as needed. Uh, we also get a number of citizen requests and the citizen requests and damage and storm damage uh, storm response. Those two items were kind of the ones that pushed us over as it related to um, contract dollars. So contract dollars for existing maintenance. We came out almost about even as we were looking at it. But when we look at the, the citizen requests and being able to respond to those sign clearance needs as they come in, um, and then you know, we also get some additional benefit from having our staffing to be able to backfill for tr street tree inspections so we can get final CFOs out the door in a hurry when our staffing is limited. Right now our urban forestry division is staffed with one urban forester. And with this purchase and the program moving forward, we'll be adding one full-time position and the existing seasonal position that we've been running. So uh, we're I looking at about a, a 15 year, expect 15 to 20 year expected life on the unit. So I was going to say, if you even were looking at 10, or say 12 years, it's 10,000 a year. And I, I would imagine that you could get into that pretty easily as far as cost for trim yeah. if, you did, if you went outside. Yeah, our contract for one tree removal is between 18 and $2,200 on average. So we can get there pretty quick. Good. Well, I appreciate it. I just, because of the amount, I just wanted to ask it. <clears throat> Questions? Oh. I had a couple questions on uh, <coughs> item D and item E. So if I, Chief, if you would. On the uh, Telogis software, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can. So good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Pat Knight, Post Falls Police. Anytime uh, 
you have a funny name on the agenda, you can certainly expect questions. I know that for sure. So, uh, Telogis. So basically, it's Telematics. Telematics has partnered with Ford and uh, a company called Telogis to install basically software and technology on your police vehicles now that can do a, a, a sorting of things. So basically, it monitors your vehicle. Uh, it will basically, you can set it up to send you notifications when you're harsh braking, rapid acceleration, when you've reached certain speeds, uh, when your oil service is due, when your vehicle's uh, tires are low. There's a list of things that this technology can do for you. But when you look across the country at what's killing our police officers, it's not gunshots, it's not weapons. It's officers being killed in traffic crashes. Uh, speeds are too high for conditions, those types of things. As you know, we're big partners with Below 100 and keeping our officers safe out on the street, keeping the community safe, wearing your vest, wearing your seatbelt at all times, those types of things. This technology really does run right in line with exactly what we're doing uh, at the police department. I think we have an obligation not only to the community but to our staff to keep them safe, and this is one of those technologies that will certainly do that. So it, it said in the, the write-up that this, you're going to try this out on four cars? That's correct. So we have uh, the f new four newest vehicles. This technology really came out on the market in 2015 for first responders. And we have our four vehicles we purchased this year on the budget. Those four vehicles we're going to test it in. Let's put it on a trial basis, see if it works for us. If we like what we're seeing, we can start outfitting the cars uh, as we purchase them from them forward. How many cars total would this go on and, you know, down the road? That's a good question. What we're looking at is if we like the technology, we'd start ordering this with the cars as we order them every year. Uh, I don't think we can go back and retrofit some of the cars. I don't believe it's even feasible to put it on anything older than 2012. Like I said, the technology really became available in 2015. So I'd probably say we'd pr start budgeting on the vehicles from here on out. Okay. And what it costs is, to be honest with you, you purchase the hardware when you purchase the vehicle. The hardware costs $400. It's a one-time fee. And then with Telogis, you, you uh, pay a monthly fee about $40 per vehicle. I can tell you on a, on a side note, Snohomish County installed this on 230 vehicles. They pay for the Telogis bill every month just because of the savings in fuel. Uh, this thing will notify you and your supervisor uh, that your vehicle has been idling for more than 20 minutes. So what it's telling the officers and the, and the people out there is shut your car off. Uh, you'll save in fuel. You'll save in all kinds of different areas. So we see it as certainly a plus. Great. Thanks for that. I did I add another quote. Oh, did you add yeah, on the same topic? No, I was going to go to an E. Okay, so on the, on the same topic, does this lock us into a, a particular brand of vehicle? You said it's a partnership with Ford. It, it came out as a partnership with Ford right now, but only because in police department world right now, Chevy has really taken themselves out of the market. Uh, the, I'm sure it will work on uh, Dodge as well. Uh, when we purchased the Fords, it really came out of, it got advertised to us as they partnered up with, with Ford. Uh, Chevy, the Impala is no longer in the game, and that was what we used to drive. Uh, really pushed us to the limit and, and moving us to Ford's. So I have not done the research if we could do it on other vehicles, but I also don't see us going away from Ford for a while. And how do your officers, officers feel about this addition? You know, I think that most of the officers have already bought into the Blow 100 theory. Uh, okay. There's going to be a few officers out there, no doubt, that are going to say this is the big brother watching theory. But again, I think that we owe it to the community, we owe it to our own public, we owe it to our officers that we're keeping them safe on the street. And if, you know what, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you should be. If you're going over the speed limit, you should be. In, and we're not looking to, to, to have this as a, I'll call a tattletale system. That's not what we're looking for. But we are looking for creating, you know, better driving habits. If we have someone out there that is having poor driving habits, we're going to have some conversations. And if we can't correct them, we'll fix a way to do it. Okay. Good. Good to go. Yes. Also on item E, there was uh, <coughs> contract with ML Architects for design work on the, the new <laughs> animal facility. Yes. But I also saw that there was an expenditure for like $2,400 to the same people for the same thing. Have we already approved this, or is that something separate? Or No. So if, you'll, if you recall, back in 2016, we were looking at expanding the existing shelter out, uh, out on the uh, west side of town. Um, after getting some discussions on that, wastewater wanting to expand their, their port, uh, property as well, the, the expansion was, was basically scratched. And we were looking at building the new facility at our, at our campus. And uh, we went to the local architect we were utilizing at that time, and the uh, cost was just, we couldn't afford that. It was triple the cost what we were looking to do. And so we uh, reached out to ML Architect, and uh, they gave us a quote for roughly $16,000 to basically provide the service for us, get us through the bidding process, and then um, we'll be able to put this project to bid and have a new campus, a new facility on our campus there. Great. Thank you. Good luck. Okay.
for the questions. I'd entertain a motion. Move to accept the consent calendar as presented. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Shannon, please take the roll. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Tonight we have uh, only one public hearing, and uh, that is on the Runcorn. Did I pronounce it correctly? Runcorn. Runcorn. Easement vacation. That was. I will open the. Uh, if anyone wishes to speak on this public hearing, there are documents on the dias in the back. Fill them out, please. Turn them into our clerk. Open the public hearing. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council President Wilhelm, Councilors, Tavis Schmidt, Associate Planner with the City of Post Falls. Um, tonight's public hearing is for the Runcorn Sewer Easement Vacation, case file VAC-17-04. The applicant is Lake City Engineering. The owner is Sandra Runcorn, and the requested action this evening is to review and approve the requested vacation of the sewer line easement. Um, highlighted in red here is the existing easement. It is on the west side of Chase Road, north of Pole Line. <coughs> um, this is the exhibit showing the existing property in the bold um, dark <coughs> line here with the easement running north-south. This is a public sewer line easement that would serve from Northern Plains First Edition to the Runcorn property and then south to the, the property on the, on the south that would be on the corner of Chase and Pole Line. Um, the property has, uh, is um, finalizing up a plat, a subdivision. Um, in the red here is approximately where the existing sewer line easement goes. The sewer has, um, has been installed in Wheatland Avenue right here and then go, going <coughs> then easterly to service the, <coughs> the new lots. In the blue here is where the sewer line, the new main line is going to the south to serve the property <coughs> that would be to the south. So the proposal is to vacate this sewer line here and essentially move it over to here so that the property to the south will still have sewer available upon development for that property to the south. Um, staff reviewed this and we found that it conforms to planning and development ever efforts. Um, Northern Plains second edition subdivisions um, undergoing platting at this time. Um, th so with that platting, it essentially makes this easement unnecessary because development has moved the easement to the east. Um, and public sewer is still available to the adjacent lots. And that's all that I have this Any time. questions of Tavis at this point? <coughs> Answer them all. Does the applicant um, wish to speak or? Um, the applicant said he can if you have questions at all. <coughs> Any questions of Drew? No. Makes perfect sense. You okay with that? Unless you have questions. No, great. Thank you. You bet. Anybody wishing to speak on this? We have none. And there's nothing to rebut at this point. With that, I will close the public hearing. Council. I would say that it makes per per perfect sense. And with no objection, I'll make a motion to approve Runcorn Easement Vacation File Number VAC-17-04. Second. Motion seconds. Further discussion? Seeing none, Shannon, please take the roll. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? <coughs> Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, tonight, next item up is unfinished business, and we have none. Citizens' issues uh, follows, and that is the section of the agenda where uh, anyone wishing to address the council on a non-agenda item uh, can come forward, give your name for the record, and we'll uh, let you talk to us. Seeing none. Next item, new business, Meadow Grove Preliminary PUD and Subdivision. Joe Manley. Good evening, Mayor Jacobson, Council President Wilhelm, and members of City Council. John Manley, Planning Manager here at the City of Post Falls. <clears throat> yes, the Meadow Grove Subdivision and PUD case file S-17-09 and P-17-03 for the PUD. The applicant and owners are the 
uh, Willamette Valley Real Property, LLC, and Alston Durant. The requested action is to review and approve the proposed subdivision and preliminary PUD. At the September 12th uh, Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, this uh, project was recommended for approval as presented. <coughs> Looking at the project location, you see it um, west of um, Chase Road, south of Grange Avenue at the southwest corner, highlighted there in the red hatched triangular um, area. The zoning is R1S. The, it's approximately just shy of 21 acres. Uh, current land use is vacant mostly. There is one uh, single family residence at the southwest corner of this area. There is no significant uh, topology or mm -hmm. vegetation issues with the site. The water provider would be East Green Acres Irrigation District with sewer being provided by the City of Post Falls. Looking at the surrounding zoning, you see um, R1S to the west and you see R1 to the east and there's once again the requested uh, area for a land use action there in the, the black hatch area. It's not unusual, it wouldn't be unusual when you look at what you have to the west and to the east that even though that it did get zoned R1S that uh, a developer would ask for some sort of um, uh, density increase potentially um, as form of a PUD just to deal with the transition of land uses here. Um, to stick solely one or solely the other could potentially have some effects. Looking at the parks, and the reason why I present this is there was some concerns with how things have been presented this, at to this point in regards to parks and the parks in the area. So I did want to shed some light on the parks in, with this PUD request and the parks in the area. When you look at the R1S area, you do see that you have two city-owned parks here. This uh, park at this location was a combination between the, the Meadows subdivision and Prairie Meadows. Then you also have a larger park here as part of uh, Prairie Meadows. You have a Craftsman Meadow Ridge, some open space that was part of that PUD. Um, here's the open space that's uh, being requested for this PUD at this location. And then you have open greens to the east <clears throat> and further to the east, you got the Post Falls, I um, mean, the Prairie Falls Golf Course, you got the cemetery, you got White Pines Park and some play fields. In Montrose, you got some other open space at that location, which is HOA maintained. Well, you see the green lines there. Um, those are the um, planned multi use trails. And so, as this area develops with single family residences, um, people can utilize these multi use trails to go to and from different areas to uh, various parks. And so, uh, the proposed park at this would just add to the park inventory being a mix of HOA maintained and city owned parks. Uh, the proposal for this is for 57 single family residential lots. Um, the density would be 2.74 units an acre. Um, there's no new real major internal streets but there is a wayward loop and we'll go into details of that when the plan when it's presented here in a bit. An access is off Grange Avenue, of which there'd be no direct access to those lots and Staples Road. As stated, about the 10% uh, open space in that park, that park is 2.09 acres. Um, and the, re and the re exceptions are to request and follow the bulk emplacement standards of the single family residential R1 for R, um, all phases, except for there is, you see within, through the public process to the point, there was some modifications to the R1S on the lots adjacent to the uh, R1S lots on the rear and some modified road standards. So here is the PUD subdivision plan as it sits now and so the these lots that you see here adjacent to the R1S as part of the and through the public process the applicant and the um, the HOA representing the the Meadows uh, agreed to a single story house only on those lots and as but they could have bonus rooms above the garages as well as they would have the 
the rear setbacks for those lots. And you can see that condition with, within that staff report. The other lots you see here internally closer to the R1 would follow the R1 guidelines and don't have that condition. John, how large are the lots that are adjacent to uh, the current R1S? Uh, they are, I don't, they range between, um, I believe about point, they're at three to point four, they're about 12,000, 13,000 square feet, I believe. Rather than these other ones are closer <coughs> to the point two acre range or 0.18 or right around there, complementary to the lots to the south. Okay. I think I know these lots here are, I believe, 8,800 square feet, right around there, because the lots to the south, on the south side of Staples Road was similarly in size. They're trying to match that same size as the lots to the south and do their best to have as wide a lots as possible to be compatible with the R1S. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> So in reviewing this, there's some PUD review criteria and some subdivision re review criteria. So first I'll go through the uh, PUD. Um, provides benefits that would not be achievable through compliance with normally required zoning standards and regulations. When you look at uh, typical subdivisions, you're not required to do any open space whatsoever. And so um, the planning staff would see that when you're adding the 10% open space that, that would provide a benefit that we wouldn't normally get with a subdivision. And so it just adds to that open space network and amenities to that area. It's compatible with the surrounding land uses, both existing and future. Uh, whether there are R1S, one acre lots or quarter acre lots, they're all in that suburban residential mix. So it'd be tough for you want to argue that it's not compatible, that it's just a transitional zoning type element. Um, if you look, and I'll go back to the shape here of this development, it's an awkward shape sitting in a county island. So staff would see that with what they're proposing, it would be compatible. It's in conformance with the goals and policies found in the Post Falls Comprehensive Plan. Um, this is to be true. They do provide the 10% open space would so meet item four. A planned unit development should provide the integrated of harmonious design and arrangements of buildings and uses. Uh, when you look at the, the layout, they did centrally locate the park. You do have equal access or equal opportunity to that park. Uh, they ha all have good access to uh, residential streets. So it would be considered they would meet that criteria as well. John, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Could you go back to that map? Is there access from the southern properties? It looks like right along the dashed line, there's an access point to the park. Yes. Right, right there. Here. Yeah. Yes, so that there is a connecting pedestrian corridor. Yeah. Okay. So if you're walking from Staples <coughs> and you're heading north, you can just go right into the park without yeah. having to walk down the street and around. Okay. Yeah, I thought that's what it was, but I was just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Also looking at the now subdivision review criteria is you would be looking at whether there's definitive provisions that have been made for water supply systems and adequate in terms of quantity, quality, and type of subdivision being proposed. Uh, East Green Acres is the, the provider for this. The next one is adequate provisions have been made for public sewer systems and the existing municipal <coughs> can accommodate the proposed sewer flows. And in this case, the city post falls has the capacity to serve the project and that the layout would be adequate. Proposed streets are consistent with the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. And it was deemed by staff that the road alli roadway alignment and cross sections are appropriate are you, they did request some exceptions in their cross sections, but those exceptions were considered to be consistent and compatible with adjoining development to the west. Uh, no direct access from the subdivision lots to Grange Avenue, as previously mentioned, and that the layout does accommodate connectivity from the residents to um, the collectors and arterials. All areas of the proposed subdivision which may involve soil or topographical conditions presenting hazards have been identified. Um, 
there is none for this <coughs> project, so this is a non-issue. Um, the area proposed for subject is zoned for the proposed <coughs> use, and the use conforms to other requirements found in this code. So, as we know, this is part of a PUD, so the subdivision will be tied to the PUD. So, subject to the PUD part of this proposal, this, if it was recommended for approval, that part of it, then the proposed subdivision layout would be consistent. So, if there's a different course of action, then that would be in conflict with this item number five pertaining to the PUD. The developer has made adequate plans to ensure that the community will bear no f more than its fair share of costs. Uh, this is why we have annexation impact fees as part of development. So, and they're paid as part of building permit to kind of pay their fair share. Uh, we didn't receive any other comments from any other agencies. And I'd stand for any uh, questions that you may have. Linda. Um, I just have a couple, John. Uh, reading through the um, subdivision plan and the PUD, it looks like the park is going to be built in the second phase. And weren't we talking a short while back about developers putting the park in in the first phase instead of later on so that we don't run into some of the same situations that we have in the past? Um, yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Uh, we're, we're, look, we're currently working on current PUD text, and with the current language that we're working on and proposing bringing in before you, because we've listened to you um, talk about this matter, that language is in the proposed language that we'll be bringing forward to you, of which we do have an out that there can still be actions to approve it in other um, phases if so deemed fit but it does give the hook to get it in the first phase if necessary. Currently, though, that language doesn't exist with our current code. I, I have a couple more if I could. Um, and then on the lots uh, <coughs> adjoining the Meadows property there, um, I think I was reading in this, um, this PUD language as well that there would be a 25-foot setback from the back of the lot. Is that right? Um, from what I under my understanding is that they were going to follow the R1S standards for the rear setback for those properties. Okay, maybe, I'm, maybe I just misunderstood. And so these lots are obviously going to be, the ones, the ones that are abutting the meadows there are obviously going to be, it looks like, I don't know, maybe 75, well, 121 and 120 feet wide coming in the driveways, plenty of room for shops in the back. And so, do you kind of get where I'm going with this? Yeah, they'll more than likely, I mean, there's a high probability that you would see <coughs> requests for a second driveway approach for a detached shop on the side, and you'd have the residents off to the other side, so whether it's west or east of the lot, and then you'd have a larger shop off set back closer to the the rear property line I would think. so that's kind of my question how close can that shop come to that property line it would be 15 feet in the r1s <coughs> okay it's it says in the planned unit development in the narrative that it's 10 feet 10 feet is the r1 so so for all of these there was an additional condition that was added after the narrative was originally submitted that to appease or attempt to appease the situation here to get the larger lots adjacent to the R1S that you would then go by the R1S setbacks to match the R1S properties to the west and that you would deal with the single story only for the residents for the, um, uh, for the, for the, and then you could have bonus rooms above the garage. There was nothing that said that you couldn't attach that garage to the residence and put the bonus rooms as an attached garage to the house. There's that, that wasn't in that condition. It was just stating that the, the residence had to be single story and that bonus rooms were allowed above the garage. And that garage could be attached or detached. Well, if you're going to put a shop in, so I th if I understand this, the intent was by the homes on the one acre lots, they wanted to keep the residents at single story. Now, if the folks put shops in, they're going to be able to go above that single story? 
The condition that was proposed by the HOA was that you could stick bonus rooms above the shop, and it didn't clarify whether that uh, or excluded. Oh, so bonus rooms above the shop. I was thinking garage only. Right. Okay. Well, even the, well, the garage shop, those are kind of semantics a little bit. I mean, if you don't have an attached garage, but you have a detached garage, and it happens to be uh, 30 by 40, is that a shop or is that a garage? Yeah. I mean, someone could argue that's their garage. It's just a large garage. I think the idea was to have those setbacks match on both sides of that property line. So you'd on both sides of the property line, you'll be using the R1S setbacks. So for the properties that are already there on, on the north side of that line, the setbacks are exactly the same as what these new properties will have. So yeah. there should be some continuity between what you're going to see developing on both sides of that joint property line. Thank you. Al? John, back to the the fact that we're looking at a PUD and a subdivision plan. If we approve this tonight, then the subdivision, if, if for some reason the developer were to sell that property and somebody else decided to come in and do a different subdivision, they'd have to come back and get that approved, correct? Yeah, they would, would more than likely have to amend the PUD and do a subdivision amendment. Depending on the particulars, it could be considered a um, a minor amendment or a major amendment, but uh, if it was major, it would go through the whole public process again. Right. My, I guess my point is, is what we're approving is pretty much what we're seeing right here. This yeah. is correct. They could make some minor adjustments, but anything major would have to come back. Any increase in density would be considered a, a major amendment, even if it was, you know, one lot. You know, I mean, okay. that's usually how we, we look at kind of those. That's as an example. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? How would you like to act, count, act council? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, it looks to me like the applicants met the conditions of a PUD, and I, I would uh, move to approve. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Jen, please take the roll. Orson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Orders? No. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Nay. Wolf? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item up is the uh, our ordinances and resolutions. Tonight we do have one ordinance with the Ross Point annexation. Move to place the ordinance Ross Point annexation file number A 16 07 on its first and only reading by title only while under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Shannon, please take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Borders? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Wilson. An ordinance of the City of Post Falls and Municipal Corporation of the State of Idaho providing for annexation of property consisting of approximately 8.45 acres located at the southeast quarter of Section 1, Township 50 North, Range 5 West and a portion of southwest quarter of Section 6, Township 50 North, Range 4 West, Boise Meridian, Kootenai County, Idaho, and zoning of said annexed property as multifamily residential R2, providing for the amendment to the official zoning map and providing for an effective date hereof. Move to approve the ordinance, uh, Ross Point Annexation File Number A-16-07, to direct the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. Motion second. For the discussion, Shannon. Orders. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is administrative staff reports, and we do have one utilities capital projects. Beach. Good evening, Mayor, Council. I actually have a really fun report to give you this uh, evening. We had a really good year in 2017 for capital projects. Uh, I want to make sure to extend thanks where thanks is due. Uh, Andrew Arbini, our project manager, is sitting here tonight. He's been a big part of the success we've had this year, as has the entire crew um, at the Water Reclamation Division, and then also in the Public <coughs> Services Department, just with support through various items. 
Uh, we've completed about $15 million in projects this summer. So not all of that was started in 2017, but as far as what we finished, uh, about $15 million worth of projects. Uh, there's four major projects, and this is another fun element of this presentation. There is one slide with text on it, and it is this one. So the rest are all pictures. Uh, we did Jacklin lift station. Uh, it was an upgrade to an existing lift station. We built a long force main along the west side of the Centennial Trail. Uh, you've heard a lot about our pilot membrane filtration project and then finished off the big upgrade at the plant for the headworks equalization and solid storage. This was the old Jacklin lift station. This is not the completed project, so I'll say that up front. Uh, this <laughs> was built in the 80s and has served us well, but it is an example of what happens when you use 100% of the useful life of a piece of equipment. This station was literally falling apart and being held together by uh, bands and wire, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, the operations crew did a great job keeping this thing running until the project was completed. Uh, we dug a giant hole next to Pleasant View Road. What this is for is emergency storage so with all the development on the west side of town, uh, we need somewhere for water to go, wastewater to go, in the event that there's a power outage. When everything is built out that goes to this lift station, that will give us 30 minutes to get there, fix whatever's wrong, turn the pumps back on, which still isn't a huge amount of time, but it's better than the five or 10 minutes we had uh, previously. <laughs> this is what the station looks like now. Uh, we had some land acquisition challenges here. So this is actually built in existing easements and right of way. Uh, we did get a temporary construction easement, but we didn't acquire land for this project. Um, you can see there's a small building that houses the controls, and then underneath there is a large storage tank that's built into the trail, and the pedestrians walk right over the top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, access is secured. So uh, we offset some land acquisition costs. We spent a little bit more on lockable features. Uh, this project was just under $1 million at $980,000. Our change order rate was actually a negative change order rate, 1.1%. Uh, so um, opportunities presented themselves through the project for some savings. We capitalized on those and didn't run into unexpected expenses. Next project I'll talk about, and you probably saw this if you were on the Centennial Trail this summer, <coughs> was the Centennial, West Centennial Trail Force Main. Now here's all the pipes staged alongside the trail. This is as you're getting close to Pleasant View. Uh, this project was also right at $990,000, so not quite $1 million. And our change order rate on this was still very respectable at 0.8%, uh, a positive change order rate, though, in this case. And again, there were a lot of things that came up in this project that required close management, and that is not an accidental change order rate. That's the result of people paying a lot of attention to things going on, getting ahead of issues and getting them resolved before they become costly. Uh, here's when the final grading was done in a kind of park area alongside the trail there. It was put back pretty nicely. And uh, all told, you walk along there, you don't even know there's a major force main running alongside it anymore. I've talked a lot about the pilot project at previous um, presentations to you. The thing I would like to highlight tonight is the amount of work that went into this on the part of the city staff. This project was originally budgeted for $2 million. We self-performed the work. You can see the uh, lumber there that's being used to hold pipes and tanks in place. Uh, the guys in this picture, that's Adam and Tim. Uh, there are a number of other folks in our water reclamation crew who actually built this uh, tools we had in last winter. Uh, rather than the budgeted $1 million or the previously planned $2 million, our hope is for this project to come in about $900,000. Uh, this is the actual membrane skid being installed. Uh, you can see it's a fairly complicated piece of equipment. Again, we didn't hire a contractor to install this. The guys did it themselves, rolled it in, plumbed it all up. Uh, look, this was pretty fun. Looking back through project photos, and this is on our Headworks Equalization Solid Storage Project, this is what the front of the plant looked like a couple of years ago. It's funny how quickly you forget, but it was an alfalfa field when I started work three and a half years ago with the city. Uh, so that project was a construction cost of $12.3 million. Engineering was another $1.6 million. So it's been a major investment in our plant. Uh, you can see here 
forms being installed for the bottom of the equalization pump station. It's about 30 feet down to the bottom of that. Um, this is, we figure it's probably the biggest hole that's been dug in Post Falls. So <laughs> get credit for that. Uh, here's kind of a panorama view as they have the tanks formed up. And you can see the little tiny forklift there in the middle of the picture, kind of putting some scale with the size of that pump station in the middle. Uh, this project is complete, is running. Uh, there's a um, few things we're trying to make run more smoothly, but by and large it's working really well for us. It's a view of the inside of the new headworks, and if you guys have been in there, it's a really nice facility. Uh, the open space on the floor you see is capacity for growth. We can chip in a new channel. This building is actually big enough that we can expand the capacity of it for about doubling the size of its current flow. And uh, it's a little hard to see, this is another panorama, but this is what the completed facility looks like. Uh, on the left, you have the equalization tanks. That's 1.6 million gallons of storage underground. In the center, there's a brick building. That's our solid storage hopper. Then on the right-hand side is the new Headworks facility. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. And I also want to put in a plug. We give great free tours. So if any of you folks would like to come check these things out in person, I'd be happy to show you around. Thanks, John. Uh, you, know, you, you put this stuff in terms that I can understand, which I really appreciate. It's, uh, I know it's a very technical uh, part of the city operation, and you do a very great job. So thanks to you and Andrew for the work you've done on that. Any questions, John? Excellent job. I'll just make a comment. Uh, I know that Andrew's only been here a few years, but looks like he's pretty much paid for his salary this year with all the savings. <laughs> I think he did in the first year, and now we're into profit mode. Right. <laughs> but no pressure. I'm glad you're no here, pressure. Andrew, though. That's, uh, it's a phenomenal job, and it's great to have you on board and running these projects. You bet. Carrie. Thank you for the same reasons, but I have a question. I don't recognize that body of water. Uh, this is in the enchantments in central Washington. That's Prussic Peak. We're thinking about annexation. I just didn't know if we had acquired something <laughs> being annexed. That I missed, but thank you. That's our new property, of course. Yay. <laughs> thank you very much, John. Yeah, great job. Do have one announcement tonight. Uh, congratulations to Jason uh, Faulkner, the finance director. Uh, Jason announced that we received the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada awards for the comprehensive annual financial report popular annual financial report and the budget book. Now, if I would have read the acronyms, it would have been the GFO, GFOA, the CAFR, and the PAFR. So that's why I didn't read them. Um, we have received the GFOA awards for excellence annually for the CAFR since 1999, that's 18 years, and for the PAFR since 2008, and for the city's budget since 2014. These are the city's main financial reports, and they are available on the city's website. And I will say it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If you want to know anything about the financial operation of the city, you can find it on the website. And I was looking at another city down in southern Idaho just for informational purposes. And the, about the best I could tell is that they did, in fact, have a budget. But that's about <laughs> the only information I could get. So please uh, pass our congratulations. Thanks on to Jason and the whole staff. Thank you. Um, no comments tonight. I hope everyone voted. It's an extremely low turnout. I know we voted at about 4.30 and we're numbers 53 and 54. Wow. So it's really a low turnout. Low. Um, and uh, council comments. Here. Well, I'd like to congratulate you, Thank Mayor, you. Councillor Wolf, and Councillor Wilhelm, um, because I know you're going to prevail in the election <laughs> but I also really wanted to sincerely thank the six uh, citizens who have put their name on the ballot to fill that open seat um, it's not an easy thing to do and I would be honored to serve with whomever prevails at the end of the day so thank you I'd just like to make a comment that Shelley probably set the standard for the CAFR and the PAFR because I think that she was the one that got that started, right? I always tell, I, when I look at Jason, if I get a chance to visit with him, I tell, tell him I know Shelly's still controlling it. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he ever fails. <laughs> oh, I know it. I know it. So, uh, Andrew, that's 18 years, and uh, you've been here one year, so you've got a little bit, a little ways to go <laughs> and continued success. Um, we do not need an executive session tonight? We do not. Next motion would be? To adjourn. adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We need to adjourn. Thank you very much. Aye.